All righty. So just a bit of background uh, from our perspective. We're a nonprofit trust, uh, Third Sector Insights. We bridge the divide between the corporate world and the third sector. So we understand the terminology, particularly by engaging with for-profit and non-profit or social impact social profit organizations uh, and, and the difference between the two. We do understand the dynamics at play in both of these environments and, and we create a platform from which uh, both can understand and engage with each other for shared benefits because we tend to have uh, a very jaundiced view of each other from the corporate world and then from the, uh, the not-for-profit or social impact. So the main objective of the trust, and, and that'll come into the ethos of the session today, is to promote improved governance and performance by equipping governing boards or governing bodies, you'll hear I'll interchange that uh, throughout the session, of nonprofit and social impact organizations to implement best practices in governance and board leadership with the commitment to providing an optimal return and social impact on the revenue that's been invested from our funders um, and donations that we receive. So that's kind of where we sit. Uh, you will see that on the left hand side, we have a non profit or social impact agenda, uh, empowered boards, social impact and long term sustainability through responsible corporate stewardship on the left. On the right over here, the profit agenda, and there's nothing wrong with making a profit. And in fact, it's a misnomer. Non profits can actually make a profit. We call them reserves, and they must be utilized in furthering the mandate of the organization. So here's our profit agenda on the right hand side, and that's a return on investment with a responsible ethos. And that'll be organizations through their corporate social responsibility that should be talking to the 16, 17 millennial, sorry, uh, sustainable development goals. So we sort of sit in the middle as a non-profit trust and we, have, we understand both sectors. So talking about it today in terms of the relationship between your board chair and your CEO, when King Solomon was asking the ultimate benefactor for something, what did he ask for? It wasn't clear terms of reference of how I engage with my board chair or my CEO or a five-year development strategy or a marketing strategy, albeit very, very important. He was asking for wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before those people who you can govern those people of yours. So your board and your board leadership and your board chair is around the board leadership and governance, and then the engagement with the CEO or the senior person tasked with making uh, the operation actually work. And there's a, there's a critical component there that we're going to unpack in our session today. So leading in a VUCA world, and for those of you that may not have heard that terminology before, VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And never before has this been um, more prevalent as we've come through three, four months of dealing with the new norm. So volatility, though, signifies rapid change, a world where nothing remains static for long. And we're seeing that as things are changing uh, and, we, and we're getting bombarded with information. And it's a tough role for your board chair and your CEO to be leading in this type of environment. The uncertainty describes the unpredictability of our world at the moment. We don't know what will come next. We're now hearing that there's been, um, you know, the, uh, is it the Black Plague in, in parts of China now that have been, uh, you know, diagnosed. And then the complexity. So the complexity, not only where we previously having to deal with as, as the nonprofit sector in South Africa, and there are 230,000 of us, by the way, in South Africa, but the complexities indicate that the causes of change are many and interwoven and more and more and more, and we're having to deal for those on a daily basis within context then to the relationship between your board chair and your CEO. And then the ambiguity acknowledges that we often don't even know the terms of the struggle that we're in. We're kind of just out there doing what we're best at in our organizations and which levers will affect which outcomes. So maybe the way we were doing it before isn't quite cutting it at the moment because of all these different things in the previous headings under VUCA. Um, and if we're going to see the whole picture before making decisions, we're kind of acting on that literally on a daily basis. So the partnership between your board chair and the CEO has now more than ever become a core critical component to the way forward in the new normal. Everyone's talking about this, the new normal, but what is the new normal? And, and if you had a fractious relationship before COVID between your board chair and your CEO, the person tasked with running the organization and the person who's the leader of the board, you've probably got bigger challenges uh, at the moment. So hopefully we'll 
unpack a bit of that today as we go through it. But the whole content of that in terms of even when, uh, you know, when King Solomon was asking for wisdom and knowledge, the board leadership role and then the CEO role should be from a servant leader perspective. So it's servant first. My role, and, and I'm privileged to be on the board of World Vision, and my role as board chair is to create an empowered environment that allows my colleagues on the board to reach their full potential. Because if we're doing that, then we're creating an environment for our CEO and, and his or her uh, senior leadership team to be able to do what they need to do. So we create that environment by making sure that policies, procedures, strategies, all of those things are in place. But, but the ethos is from a servant leadership role to ensure that that's my job. My job as the board chair is to ensure that the organization is fully equipped, fully funded, fully resourced, and we've created an empowered environment for the board to fully achieve and reach their potential and the operational team. So now we're going to drill into the board chair and the CEO partnership and just how critical this is. So understand how critical this relationship is. Um, and it's not just about having a lack of care every quarter when we all get together at a board meeting um, and there's some nice muffins and maybe coffee, although that's, uh, that hasn't been uh, the way for the last four months as we've had virtual meetings. And uh, Anna and I was just chatting. I've, I've just finished a lovely cup of soup and I said, I'll put some in Dropbox. Um, so, so that even the paradigm of meeting has changed. So your board chair and CEO uh, relationship is core critical. And, and it's two pieces of this jigsaw of your organization. Now, of course, today for this session, those are the two central pieces, but around that is your fundraising, your mar uh, monitoring and evaluation, your marketing, your development, uh, your administration, uh, your governance, it's all of those components. But, but this is, they've got to fit together and work together. That doesn't mean they have to be exactly the same types of people and you're gonna see, I'm gonna unpack that, okay. So I hope this isn't uh, your organizations when if you're the CEO or the general manager or center manager get together with the board chair. Um, I hope this isn't uh, the types of meetings you have where it's, you know, in the absence of an agenda, I thought I'd just spend the next couple of hours droning on and on about anything that pops into my head. Um, and then you have your poor company secretary, if you're privileged to have one, kind of sitting there. Um, and many organizations, by the way, they have this, where it's a very loose structure and that's, that's fine to a certain extent, but there's got to be structure in this relationship and how we engage. Okay, so the board chair and the chief executive partnership, and that's what it is. It's a partnership between these two individuals who come from very different backgrounds, and you're going to see that. And if your organization doesn't have a proper skills matrix in place at the moment and a proper succession plan in place for the board chair, for the CEO, for your board members, you've got a challenge on your hands, particularly over the next 12 months. So the partnership of the board chair and the chief executive provides a structure for accomplishing the tasks of the organization. So upward, in terms of your board chair as the board leader and the board and our roles and responsibilities, but not getting involved in operational issues. And then downward, once we've delegated across to the executive team, the tasks then get carried out at an operational level. So governance and management actually complement and support each other, together focused on the mission through different perspectives and actions. So we're not doing exactly the same thing. We're going towards the same objective to reach, to answer the question is why does this organization exist? Within context though, to our role as a board, my role as a board chair, and the role as the CEO and his or her senior leadership team, and then how we interact. Carrying on from that, the partnership, and you'll see I use it, it's a collaboration, it's a partnership itself is critical in providing the communications headquarter. So when we communicate outwardly to stakeholders, we've got external stakeholders and internal stakeholders, we have to understand that there should be one version of the truth, which is the truth and the facts that are communicated to the board chair and then through the CEO. Um, so it's, it's for sharing the information, addressing issues, because there should be no curveballs. Uh, you know, things happen. I prefer, and I say to, to uh, the CEO that I'm privileged to be working with at World Vision, my door is open metaphorically. Um, together, we can deal with this issue. If I don't have the answer, I have a, a network of colleagues I can contact, and equally, I may have a question for the CEO, and they have to go and access theirs. But it's addressing the issues, planning the next steps, 
appropriate to the individual and collective responsibilities of those two functions. Okay. So the question I have is which one of these do you think is the CEO? And generally the feedback I get is it's the, uh, the lady in the background who wants to strangle that board chair, um, you know, who's probably a very nice person, but not running the board meeting very well. There isn't a set agenda, um, you know, a very affable, high EQ emotional quotient person, but not very good on process and managing uh, the board. So hopefully you don't have a, uh, a board chair like that, or it could be the other way around, but that's the CEO and it's the board chair in the background wanting to, uh, to strangle uh, the board chair. But uh, you'll be amazed at how often I can see these looks if I'm sitting in on a board meeting. Okay, so the board chair and chief executive partnership, and again, you're gonna see, I keep using that word, it's a partnership. On the left-hand side, you'll see over here the board chair and the board chair leadership. Over here, the chief executive leadership because they both then are leading their specific part of the organization going forward. And, and as you know, the difference between management and leadership is we can manage activities and you can manage people, but generally you'll get not as much outcome and impact. If we manage activities and we lead people, very different component. And the two roles are very different. So the board chair leads the board and the colleagues on the board and engages with the CEO, leads the CEO, but equally the CEO leads his or her team, but can also then lead upwards. So on the left-hand side, the board chair, no micromanaging. If everything's in place, if all the policies and the procedures, terms of reference are all in place, and we've put those parameters in place as the board, we should be able to take our hands off, and I should, as a board chair, trust our CEO, who's been tasked and delegated with the approval frameworks and, and uh, the rest, to be able to do what they need to do. So my primary focus on the left as a board chair is the governance component that falls here. Determine mission and purpose, select the chief executive, support and evaluate the chief executive, those are the roles. Monitor and strengthen programs based on the feedback I get from uh, the ops team and, and our board. Ensure adequate financial resources, that's our role. Build a competent board, that's part of your board chair's role in terms of making sure that you have a proper succession plan in place. You know what the tenure is, and tenure is how long can I be a board member before I can stand again or I have to leave. Build into that board development. We should be constantly looking to improve ourselves as board members. Don't make the mistake that I did uh, when I first came into the space well over 20 years ago that I thought because people accepted a position onto the board and maybe they were members of the Institute of Directors, they knew what they were doing. My experience in 20 years, and I include myself in this statement, is 80 to 90 percent of us accept a position onto a non-profit board because it's probably a friend of ours who says, look, we'd like you to come onto the board without a clue about our role and responsibilities, fiduciary responsibilities and the rest. And we don't even know about our role and engagement with our, our, our CEO. So board development becomes critical. And then in the boardroom, again, on the right hand side, you'll see that's our CEO. So no micro governing. <clears throat> and, and then there's the, the management component that they work through, commit to the mission. So there's gotta be a mission fit. I need to understand and the CEO needs to understand and engaging with me is my interpretation of our strategy the same as theirs? Are we on the same page? Because if we're not, I may be taking decisions as a board chair and directing the board towards a decision and a resolution that may be contrary to what the chief executive actually wants. So I have regular meetings with our board chair, sorry, our, our CEO <coughs> from, uh, from World Vision on a regular basis, just to touch base and to say, please, let me know the good and the bad. If I'm only getting all the good news, alarm bells are gonna be ringing. We live in the real world, and as we've seen, we live in a VUCA <clears throat> world now. Share with me the tough warts and all. Come to me though, not with the problems, but with at least two or three solutions to those issues as the CEO, because it's a very different mindset that then has a look uh, at those issues. So again, that's, that's on the CEO. And then our shared tasks sit in the middle. Mutual respect and trust, you have to have that. If you cannot trust your CEO, or if the CEO can't trust their chair or vice chair or other board members, you've got a challenge. 
there's got to be reciprocal communication. So I always say be, you over communicate at the front end if I'm coming in as a new board chair. And then we eventually find we okay, look, I don't need to know all that information. And we find where the best uh, flow of information to me, what the key indicators are. A shared purpose and mission driven, as I said, we've got to make sure we're on the same page. Otherwise, we'll be pulling in different directions. And then context for the good of the organization. So whenever we meet, it's to discuss the issues in the best interests of serving our beneficiaries. So from a World Vision perspective, that is the most vulnerable children in the communities that we're privileged to serve. The middle block is shared responsibility is social stewardship uh, over the fiscal uh, component. So that's money that's been made available. Uh, successful planning, strategic planning, you'll see that coming through and then dropping down into the shared income. So this is an overlay of the two core components of the leadership of your organizations. So just to drill into that a bit more, responsible governance and delegation of authority model. You know, we can have the, the easy part, and this is why you heard right at the beginning, we talk about applied governance. The statutes are there, the legislation is there, the codes of good practice are there. Um, there you just go into Google and you can download templates of uh, terms of reference and board chair job descriptions, they're out there. How do we take that and make that part of the ethos of our organization and make sure that our board chair and CEO understand the delegation of authority model. So this model here, <clears throat> on the left you'll see this is the board chair responsibility, although they have overall responsibility for the organization. But in terms of a governance and leadership component is here. Our moment of truth over here between your board chair and your CEO on the left is here. So we've got our stakeholders. Your organizations have stakeholders. Those are the people that we are accountable to. And when we meet in board meetings, aren't able to attend the board meeting. And we have responsible stewardship at the top here at a board. So your governing body, we buy into the vision or we're coming, we've been brought onto the board because we either have a, um, an exciting new adaptation to that or we can add to it. But you know, we can have the most magnificent vision and we can have this beautiful picture that we're moving towards. But if you don't have a proper strategy in place that allows you to achieve that vision, you're gonna have a, a challenge on your hands. And particularly if your board chair and your CEO have different interpretations of the vision and the strategy. Equally, we can have all of this. This is the easy part. We go away on a vision, you know, a weekend away, vision, mission, strategy. If you do not have the funding, and, and a couple of the sessions throughout the day are covering that, you don't have the funding to be able to do what you need to do. You can have the best vision and strategy in the world, not going to happen. So the, again, the partnership between the board chair and the CEO needs to understand Funding is obviously one component of the resources. Have we got the capacity? Have we got the funds? Have we got everything we need? And then, of course, oops, um, we have our policy and procedures that underpin that. So we have our governing body in the middle, and the leader of the governing body is your board chair, um, and, and they have this responsibility at a strategic level, so 90% looking forward, 10% looking back. And the moment of truth is when we delegate all of this to our responsible management team. And that means that we've made sure that everything is in place and we delegated and I as a board chair can have the comfort that I've fully equipped our CEO and his or her team and have ensured that they have the means with, within which they can achieve what they need to achieve and made sure that I've created an empowered environment that allows them to go and do that. And then our CEO's responsibility is now here in terms of that responsible management to go and engage with the actual beneficiary. So their moment of truth is when any individual, in fact, all of our moments of truth is when any individual engages with a beneficiary. Because if we can't answer the question today, is our discussion, is our meeting helping us improve our service delivery to that most vulnerable child, then why are we having this discussion? Um, and, and that sort of clears away the clutter. So that's the responsible governance and delegation of authority model uh, going forward. To put that into perspective then is, as I've mentioned already, here's your board. So the board is your highest governing level. There's the vision, as we saw in, in the previous model. Normally that's broken down into the mission and that gets broken down into strategic priorities. Now most organizations, it might be called key performance areas or programs or these red arrows 
are one strategic priority for the organization or one key performance area or one program. Now, at a board level, we get communicated back at the board meeting through the board pack around the seven different programs, let's say. Let's call these seven programs that we're running. If those get broken down, down here, for example, at an operational level, you might have 10, 20 different goals that have to be set or objectives that need to be met to meet that one strategic priority, which then gets reported to the board. So the board owns it and adopts the vision, mission, and strategic priorities in engagement with the team. We then delegate. So the moment of truth, as you saw in the previous model here, down at the bottom, responsible management, we've delegated across. This talks here as well. We delegate across here. So we delegate across, we take our hands off, but we must make ensure that on the right-hand side, management now is fully equipped, fully resourced, fully funded, fully capacitated, and have the means by which they can achieve what we expect them to do as a board and ultimately the board chair, because that's the person who will be your public face if we have to go to market. So we focus as a board and as a board chair on the ends, why does this organization exist? And on the right-hand side, we've got to make sure we understand, and you will be amazed at how many board members do not understand the seven imperatives or the key programs or what has to happen at an operational level. So as we drop down just to the bottom here, just as a note, the board and management work together to define the strategic priorities, which are owned by the board and the board chair ultimately, and implemented by management within the executive limitations. And that's your policies and procedures, your approval frameworks, delegation of authority, terms of reference for your uh, subcommittees, all of those things, and those are set by the board. So again, that's putting into perspective and just understanding the relationship component between your board chair and your CEO. So within that context, let's look at the role clarity between the board chair and the CEO. So the relationship between your board chair and CEO, sorry, your board and your CEO, so sorry, let me go back. Uh, the board and the CEO, because um, there's a relationship there and then that gets tightened up when you look at the, the board chair. So the relationship between your CEO and the board, now I'm dealing with one organization, by the way, they have 20 members uh, on the board. Each member phones the CEO every day. And whereas the CEO says to me, Malcolm, I'm so you know, impressed that I have an engaged board, but I can't get my work done because they each have an opinion. Uh, and that's the board directly contacting the CEO and there needs to be a proper communication strategy in place. So what can derail the relationship between your CEO and your board? We're a board that engages in micromanaging instead of concentrating on the big picture. Where, like I've just said, every day they're phoning the CEO and they're just creating a, a, you know, an operational nightmare for that CEO. It can also be derailed where a CEO who obsessively controls the agenda and information flow to the board. Um, and we call that sandbagging. Um, so it's a filtering of only the good news to the board. And I say, no, I want everything, good, bad, and the ugly because together we're a formidable team and we can work on this. Um, and there's no curve balls. Um, you know, I might get a phone call from a journalist saying, what's your perspective about this? And if I'm not up to speed on it, I may make, may make an inappropriate comment the next thing on front page of the Sunday Times. So we need to make sure that the information flow is correct through the strategic imperatives up into the board. And that in terms of the information flow, if it's controlled too much by the CEO, it can frustrate board members' efforts to set policy and plans and engage with the programmatic uh, feedback at a board level. Also, we're a board that has an unreasonable set of expectations for the CEO and then provides little in a way of guidance and support. And that's why you'll see I harp on have we as a board and have I as the board chair ensured that our CEO and his or her team are fully equipped because if they are and we can tick the box on that, then we can have a fair expectation that they're going to do what they said they're going to do in the next quarter. And when we get together at the board meeting, we're going to get the board pack and we're going to ask those questions. But I've sat in a many board uh, you know, meetings where the, the board pats themselves on the back and says, weren't we magnificent? We've given our CEO another 150 things to do. And the answer is no. Not unless you've made sure, because one or two things are going to happen. If you load those extra 150 things onto your CEO, general manager, center manager, something has to be sacrificed to do that. 
because they probably only built and have a capacity to deliver on what we previously agreed on. So if we're expecting extra stuff, we should either bring more funding, more resource, more capacity uh, to the table as the board, that's our role and give their guidance and support without interfering in the day-to-day -day operations. Okay. What can also derail it is we're a board that is fractious and is unable to articulate a unified vision for the organization. And that's why you'll see, I'll keep coming back to that. We have to understand you, you don't want 12 yes people all from the same background on your board. Because if I sit in a board meeting and all I see is nodding and rubber stamping, that sends different alarm signals. You also don't want a fractious uh, board. We need to make sure that we're on the same page in terms of the passion and drive for why we're here. And that's when we should break away and say, is this discussion helping us serve the most vulnerable child and their family and their community? If the answer to that is yes, then we continue with the conversation. If it's no, then we should shut it down. Uh, and maybe we need to do some board development and, and do a board performance evaluation. And then also where there's a total lack of enthusiasm on the part of the board. I have seen this where board members have been on the board too long. Um, tenure hasn't been written into their appointment and tenure means you can come onto the board, you stay on the board for three years and then you can stand again for another three years as a board member, but then you've got to go away for two years. Equally, um, if you're not doing board performance evaluations, you may have some people that have been on the board five, 10, 15 years um, and, and they're taking a seat away from somebody who could be adding value to your organization. So again, you should be linking your skills matrix to your succession plan, to your strategic plan going forward for your board chair, for your CEO and your board members and making sure that it talks to your strat plan going forward. So that's how um, a fractious or uh, the board can frustrate the CEO relationship and, and interfere. All righty. So this one I normally put up, um, but because we're doing it virtual, um, it does cause a bit of a problem. Uh, so uh, normally it's, it's uh, you know, there's an effect. So the first one that would come up is your top right hand side. The governing body establishes the parameters within which management must operate. So there it is. There's your core documents, uh, your founding document, your policies, procedures, your approval framework, your delegational authority, your terms of reference for your um, your subcommittees, your code of good practice, whether it's the Inutella code or it's the King 4 code or, or whatever it is. Then on the left hand side is your risk oversight. So your board chair and your CEO should understand what are the top five risk components the organization faces in the next foreseeable future, the next 12 to 18 months, and what is our mitigating strategy to address that. And you should have an asset register. At the bottom then, the third part of our frame is strategy. And as we've talked to, I mean, we can have all this stuff, but if we don't have a clear strategy and our succession planning and our skills matrix and our tenure talks to our strategy going forward. And then on the right hand side, accountability. So the CEO will be holding us as the board accountable and the chair ultimately, and the chair and the board will be holding the CEO accountable and his or her team to go and do what they said they were going to do. If we've ensured, if you remember, uh, the previous slide that they fully equipped, fully resourced, fully funded, fully capacitated and have the means through which they can achieve what we expect. So normally what I do, I click on this and these brown lines kind of open up inside the parameters. And what this says at the bottom left, management can then go anywhere with inside those parameters that we've set in place as the board, or we've been brought onto the board because our skills matrix meets some of the gaps that have been identified in our governance gaps. We come onto the board and we take our hands off and our team can operate inside there without us phoning every day or worrying. But if for any reason they step outside of these boundaries and it's brought to our attention, the top right hand side, so if management breaches any of those parameters, the governing body must take effective remedial action because if we don't, we will have been seen to not have been discharging our duties and therefore we could be held liable. So let's say it happens again. Maybe it's something that, uh, you know, we've never had a policy or procedure. It's never happened. Um, we take the remedial action. The new policy is brought in or there's, there's a disciplinary procedure or whatever it is. We bring it back in line. There's now a new policy in place to address that. We take our hands off and we can allow our team to go and do what they do better than we do is to actually serve the beneficiaries. 
So the bottom right hand uh, star there is the governing body and management must respect and support the distinct role of the other. And then the leaders of those two groups, which is your board chair and your CEO, must also then understand the distinct difference and support of their partnership and their roles in this engagement. Does that make sense? The role of the board chair, and, and I have talked about it a bit, but it, it, it really is critical. I've sat in so many meetings, not unique to the nonprofit sector, by the way, but it's predominant and not unique to South Africa. Uh, we have 231,000 nonprofit organizations registered on the Department of Social Development's register at the moment, but globally 12 million. Um, and what I find in a lot of uh, organizations is the chair gets appointed by default. Uh, you know, we'll be having a board meeting uh, and then someone ooh, says, Malcolm, it's your, last, it's your last, last board meeting today as chair. Yes, ooh. Okay, so who wants to be board chair? Next thing, there's no eye contact. Everyone's very busy making notes because nobody wants the board chair role. It's a huge responsibility. So the role of the board chair must be seriously thought through and you should have a clear and distinct board chair succession plan. Okay. So the role of the board chair, the board chair serves as the leader of the organization. Is there a question? No. Okay. Um, the board chair serves as the leader of the organization's board of directors or governing body. We interchange that because we have four different types in South Africa, which has ultimate governance responsibility for the organization. So the buck stops at your board chair. At that chair, that's where the buck stops. The board, though, holds the final say on the overall strategy of the organization, as well as appointing the CEO. So your board appoints one person. That is the senior person tasked with running the organization at an operational level. Some call a CEO, I'm a managing trustee. You'll have a, a, you know, a president and CEO, you have general managers, center managers. Whoever that senior person is that's tasked, the board appoints that one person. Okay. So the board also controls the budget of the organizations. We can't go and commit this to this beautiful strategy. We go away in a three-day strategy, uh, you know, weekend and planning. If we don't have the funds, um, you know, and the proper financial management systems in place, et cetera, et cetera, to manage that. So as the leader of the board, the chair carries immense responsibility and in fact, total responsibility for the organization. It's a huge and onerous responsibility because if anything untoward happens, that's where the buck's gonna stop. Okay, so that's very quickly the role of the chair, the role of the CEO and the personal relationship then with the board chair, because we have to understand there's a professional relationship um, that is paramount and tantamount to things getting done, but then there's a personal relationship between your CEO and your board uh, chair. So understand how critical that is and to differentiate between it. You know, there is that saying that says familiarity breeds contempt. So it's to find the right line where, where we, we don't either as the board chair or the CEO overstep the boundaries from professional into personal uh, relationship. Okay, so the CEO is sometimes called executive director, as I've mentioned earlier, you know, some organizations have uh, different terminology for it, is the top administrator, operational person of the organization, and the CEO is appointed by and reports to the board of directors. So, so collectively, however, the direct report would be through to the board chair um, and implements the strategy, making sure that we as the board uh, and the board chair is ensured that they've got the full means through which they can do that. The CEO then manages the staff and the day-to-day -day operations. We as governing body members, and particularly myself as a board chair, must never get involved in day-to-day -day operations. And even in board meetings, you will see very quickly when a conversation starts drilling down too much into operational detail, it's the board chair's role to say, look, I think we're getting too um, involved in the day-to-day -day operations. We trust our CEO and their staff, we should back up. So it's the day-to-day -day operations and is responsible for making tactical decisions required for meeting the goals set by the board. And you know, many times that's tough as a CEO. So for those of you that are CEOs, you know, there's a judgment call that happens constantly, particularly as we live in a VUCA world, and maybe you're not able to get a hold of your board chair. Uh, and there is that saying that says, sometimes it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. 
as long as that decision is acting in the best interest of ensuring that we're serving our beneficiaries. And or if it's brought to your attention that there's something that could be happening that is life threatening, then you act uh, straight away on that. Okay, so, so that's the role. Looking at the personal relationship between the CEO and the board chair, that'll depend on personalities. And you know, many times um, I've seen a lot of organizations where the CEO and board chair don't particularly like each other, but they have a professional uh, respect for each other. So personalities, character traits, uh, background, upbringing, a whole herd of things come into play here, colleagues. So it's not just a technical component. There's the emotional uh, engagement. So it depends on the personalities of the individuals occupying those roles, as well as the nature of the organization. Um, and, and as uh, was said earlier, you know, there may, may be different approaches and different areas that your organizations are serving. So some nonprofits tend to appoint business leaders as their chair while appointing program specialists as the CEO. And I'm gonna show you how um, that can uh, cause a bit of uh, tension if you don't understand the different backgrounds of the people you're putting into these positions. So for example, an arts organization where the chair may be a business person may appoint the CEO who is a former dancer or accomplished director. This can lead to tense interpersonal, interpersonal relationships due to different worldviews. We have different worldviews. We have different perspectives. So we need to understand that and respect that as the board chair and the CEO in that relationship. However, regardless of the background of the CEO and the board chair, when the two roles clash, it often presents problems for the organization that must be rectified by the board to ensure smooth operation of the nonprofit. We need to address that as this is brought to the board's attention. So the framework for the board chair and the CEO relationship. Okay, so we looked at the board uh, and how it can derail uh, the CEO and, and what the CEO is doing. We've looked at the board chair role, we looked at the CEO role and then that personal relationship. And then the framework, we looked at the other one that showed no micro sort of governance, no micro management. But the framework for the board chair and the CEO relationship, again, understand how important this is. The framework really in going forward is to be sure that the CEO and board chair share that strategic or share strategic issues. So we understand that is my interpretation of our strategic priorities and strategic issues as a board chair the same as the CEO? Because if they aren't and we're out of alignment, then we, we should have a discussion around that. So with each other, negative as well as positive, to find out where the gaps are. Um, is it only a 5% gap between my interpretation understanding or is it an 80, 90% because that'll tell us where we need to spend. So let's say out of the seven imperatives, we're pretty much on sides with five of them, uh, but number six, I see it very different to the CEO and number seven, the CEO sees it very different to me. We need to focus in on that to make sure that we're in alignment. So a failure by either the chair or the CEO to share information, such as a tightening of the bank's credit policy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, can have serious fiscal consequences. That's just one item. Um, you know, maybe the board chair takes a decision to do something, doesn't communicate it to the CEO. It can cause all kinds of problems. So it's a two-way street as well in terms of communicating. It's critical for the CEO to conduct orientation sessions with a new chair. Um, I, I was taught uh, by a previous mentor in one of the organizations I was in, and it sort of it was saying, beware of the third board chair. Um, and, and I haven't quite unpacked uh, what goes into that, but it happened that that's what happened. Um, I was the CEO of that particular organization. Uh, it was a, it was a, a social economic development organization. Um, first board chair was awesome. Second board chair was awesome. Third board chair was an absolute nightmare. Um, and, and I had to sit down and, and we had to have a, a conversation just to make sure and understand. And the reason it was a nightmare was because that individual's understanding and perspectives of the strategic imperatives were totally different to mine. So we had that conversation, we got in alignment and, and it resolved uh, the issues quite rapidly. So the CEO can help the chair keep the board focused on strategic issues. And, and that's again, the partnership coming in, whether they're programmatic or financial or other. Um, and, and again, you're going to see the string or the, the thread that runs through all of this is this partnership and the respect for each other. So again, the framework uh, in terms of the board chair and the CEO relationship, the board has only one major employment decision to make, as I've said, is to recruit and appoint the CEO. 
but it is usually a long and exhausting process and it can cause internal morale challenges in your organization. But once it's completed, the employment of all other staff and personnel is the responsibility of the CEO and the CEO's management team. So we shouldn't as a board, I'm dealing with one where all board members want to sit in on every senior leadership or senior executive uh, appointment. Um, I'm saying, well, maybe have a look at the CV, give your input, but don't you trust uh, your CEO? They're the one who is going to have to work with those individuals. Okay. So for senior positions, most CEOs, as I've mentioned, ask their chair and a few other board members to meet with senior candidates. So maybe meet, but not in the interview phase. Um, but the ultimate responsibility remains with the CEO and the board also has a responsibility to ensure that there is a CEO succession plan. Okay. The CEO can be helpful to uh, the board chair ensuring that there is a board succession plan as we said in place um, and the chair and CEO need to lead in establishing meeting agendas and make sure that we don't just have this you know this loose agenda and you should have a fixed agenda in terms of your board meetings and even when you meet with the CEO. So another board that I'm on, I've just said to the CEO, look, let's block off 10 o'clock every second Friday. If you've got something to discuss, that's fantastic. Uh, if you haven't, just drop me an email, say, look, no real change from last week. Perfect. Um, and, and we have that as a regular uh, agenda and we have a couple of agenda items that are in there. So the two partners must work together to assure there's sufficient meeting time to discuss and resolve strategic issues. Okay. So what I'm going to run through here, I've pulled together comments from a seasoned NPO board chair from a local organization in South Africa, but it's part of a global structure. Also from a CEO of a global organization, a huge organization, but with a local uh, organization here in South Africa. And then I actually had a conversation with a service provider uh, who serves the sector, just to see those perspectives in terms of what are their views. So we're going to get a view from a board chair terms of the relationship, board chair, CEO, we're going to get a view from a CEO, CEO, board chair relationship, and then we're going to see from a service provider's perspective, the relationship between the CEO and the board. So comments from an NPO board chair from this uh, global organization, but with a local organization in South Africa. Trust is fundamental, like in any relationship. Therefore, an investment at initial stage will be critical. And that's an investment in trust. Trust two ways, board chair, CEO, respect of each other's role or each person's role. So we need to understand and clarify that. Many boards do not clarify the board chair role. They get appointed by default um, and then just, it just the cycle just continues. We need to break that cycle and make sure we've got proper succession planning, proper chairperson in with a clear terms of reference or a job description. So the person's role, it's critical and important to avoid overstepping the boundaries between your CEO and the board chair. There has to be an openness in the communication, which will be enhanced by the level of trust. Monthly one-on-one -on -one meetings are very useful. Now, remember, this is a board chair sharing their perspective of the relationship with the CEO. And then the ability to speak truth and not being judgmental. So we're saying we're not judging, but we're going to hold you accountable. And then the board effectiveness hinges on a good relationship between the chairperson and the CEO. It will flow through. You know, there's that saying that a fish starts smelling from the head down. So if you've got a you know, fractious board and you don't have a great board chair, and if you've got a frustrated CEO, that is a recipe for disaster and it needs to be addressed. Okay, and, and the board effectiveness, board performance evaluations, checking are we doing what we should be doing, should be done on a regular basis. So that was from the board chair's perspective. This is from, and I'm conscious of time, uh, the CEO, the NPO of the CEO, large organization, global structure, but local application here in South Africa. And this is what this person says. So we looked at it from the board chair perspective. Chemistry between the CEO and the board chair is hugely important. Board chair's willingness to truly seek to understand the organization as best as he or she can. Uh, for example, it's corporate philosophy and DNA and understand, are we on the same page? So we may have a passion for the issue, but we may have a very different interpretation of how we should be addressing it. And if that happens and that happens in a board meeting, uh, there's, there's going to be attention. And then the last bullet point is that the CEO and chair have open and agreed upon communication lines and times to speak frankly. Okay. 
This is again the CEO saying that the board chair listens to the observations of the CEO because they, they are operating at an, uh, an operations level, at a more detailed level, with regard also to other board members. So i.e. board chair, I mean, I love the fact that my, you know, my, my fellow board members are finding me every day, um, but this is what it's doing. I'm not complaining. Is there a better way we can manage it? So it's that kind of communication. So for, expect, for example, do they have an agenda, personal bias, different cultural perspectives? You need to understand that because we want diversity on our board, but then we better make sure that we have mechanisms to manage that if anything untoward happens. And the bottom bullet point is that both parties seek to keep each other fully in the loop, no curveballs, warts and all, because we can deal with it. Together, we're a formidable team. If I walk into a board meeting and I get sidewinded or ambushed, so that both parties seek to keep each other in the loop on issues that pertain to the organization, material issues and its functionality. Okay. So now this is um, comments from a seasoned NPO practitioner. Good understanding of the different roles. You're going to see that is coming through. Coming with the different positions is important and critical. It's generally recognize that the chair uh, and the CEO should not be the same person. Some organizations do that and it just causes a huge conflict of interest. This is because they actually have different mandates and roles and it's a very difficult role to do. King 4, which is the, uh, the King Code of Good Practice, recommends that the CEO of the organization should not also be the chair, they, they recommend it, and that the retired CEO should not become the chair of the governing body until they've been away for at least three years out of the role of CEO um, and after the end of the tenure, because that can also cause tension in a board. This is also from the, uh, the professional, seasoned uh, service professional, um, and this is because, oh, there it is, the CEO's function is dedicated towards operational execution. The chair's role is towards leading the governing body in the objectives and effective discharge of its governance and role and responsibilities. And the bottom bullet point is a proper understanding of their respective roles will also help in appreciating their different contributions and value add. Also, the chairperson forms part of the employer, whilst the CEO is an employee. Again, different roles, different paradigm, different dynamics. So the one appointed under the constitution or your founding document, Memorandum of Incorporation Trust Deed, and the other appointed in terms of an employment contract, two very different uh, relationship components. And the last bullet point there is other issues like trust and respect are important, but the framework of the relationship, as we saw earlier, is uh, uh, very important and critical and will facilitate a relationship that is based upon trust, respect, and qualities. And you'll see I've put a link into a site called Kryptoni. It's worth having a look at the covers trust. Okay, so I'm closing out here now, which we'll probably have five or six minutes for questions. But um, So what you leave behind when we go through all of this is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. And that's why when we meet, we accept a position onto a board, we appoint a CEO, if I'm a board chair or board member, this is what it's all about. So what I've just put in here for you, just in closing, was we have an e-learning program. If, if you, you were looking at it, and either as an executive or staff member or governing body member, um, there's four modules, um, and uh, we've we put it together, uh, particularly specifically designed for executives and governing body members of nonprofits, um, and it's grouped under four modules. There are the four modules that you'll see. You would register. We're in Lesotho in Malawi. You go through the modules, the four modules here. You get an 80% aggregate. And then, of course, that uh, allows you then in terms of your personal uh, governance development for the next phase. That's just the landing page, um, and you'll see we're part of the, uh, the World Institute of Governance for Nonprofit Organizations. That's uh, module one, sections and objectives you pop into. I'll just put that in very quickly as we close out. Um, and if you are interested as, as uh, after this process and because you've attended today, we're offering a 50% discount. The program itself is valued at 15,000 Rand. We normally offer it uh, to market at 1,200 Rand per, per person, but we're offering it up till the end of October uh, for 600 Rand per person in the four modules. Drop me an email. Uh, if you just put that code that's there, the green code, into the subject line, uh, we'll be in touch and, and you'll get the discount for that. Okay, so there's a couple of interesting uh, sites um, to go through. It's, it's the NPO register. Um, CRPC, Company and Intellectual Property Commission. The Institute of Directors has some phenomenal material uh, that you can go on. They have what they call practice notes and they have resources for free. Uh, there's our site, which is Third Sector Insights. 
non-profit lawyer, which is Ricardo uh, Weingart. Also, you go onto his site, he has some phenomenal material available. And he has some great YouTube clips. If you just you, um, go Ricardo Weingart on YouTube, some phenomenal clips for you and your board. NGO Pulse uh, used to be the old Sangonet, or Sangonet, old uh, Sangoko. NGO Law, uh, based in Durban, have some great information. Inyatello, as well, some phenomenal information. And then Katoni, uh, which is on the trust. Okay. So this is my famous, uh, not my famous, my favorite uh, quote. And just in closing now, to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived this is to have succeeded. So I thank you all for the work you do tirelessly every day and many times as unsung heroes. Thank you for that. I also want to thank uh, Anna for hosting and uh, just uh, coordinating if there's any questions that come through. Zoe, thank you for the techie side, uh, behind the scenes, um, and then also the NPO Service Providers Network that I'm privileged to be part of. So thank you so much.